unsupervised learning, or the art of letting your computer learn by itself. You're ready to discover two different unsupervised learning algorithms, with an intuitive and enlightening example. Hopefully, at the end of the video, you'll understand better how unsupervised learning works and what can be done with it. But first, what does unsupervised learning mean? When doing machine learning, we often use labeled or target data. That means for each entry, for example, an animal brain and foot size, we already know the output. Here, for example, we know the red points are dolphins and the blue ones would be crocodiles. And we use those input-output pairs to train a model so it's able to predict the output given a new input. But what if our data is not tagged? What if we don't know which point represents a dolphin or a crocodile? A human will still be able to tell that there are two separate clusters and deduce that each one is corresponding to a separate species. The goal of unsupervised learning is to algorithmically reproduce this reasoning. I've decided to explain and show you two algorithms so we can compare the results and how they operate. The first one is called k-means and the second one is called a Kohonen map. To explain and visualize those algorithms in action, I'll restrain the application to a specific yet intuitive example. Let's say we have a 50 per 50 pixel image. Each color is represented with three bytes, one for the red, another for the green, and the last one for the blue channel. This allows us to represent more than 16 million different colors but it comes with a cost, which is that each pixel needs 3 bytes. So the final size of the image is 7.5 kilobytes. Of course, a unique image doesn't use that many colors. Moreover, it only needs a very few to be visually correct and recognizable. So our goal will be taking an image to represent it with a small number of different colors. Let's say 25. If you don't see the link between this problem and unsupervised learning, no worries. It will be very clear in a minute. The first step is to be able to represent and visualize the colors from our image. To keep things as simple as possible, we'll start with a two dimensions plot. As the colors are in three dimensions, red, green and blue, I used a trick to reduce the space to only two dimensions. I switched the color space from RGB to hue, saturation and value. This consists in switching from the Cartesian coordinate system where the three axes are red, green and blue to a cylindrical coordinate system. This simply consists in declaring three new variables and expressing those in function of X, Y and Z or RGB in this case. Then I just modified the image so for each pixel the saturation is equal to 1. It results in an oversaturated image, but it removes one dimension so it will be easier to visualize the algorithm and understand everything. Now let's plot each pixel in the 2D resulting space. Here the x-axis represents the value and the y-axis is for the hue. As I plot the color of each pixel from the image, you can notice that some parts of the space are very populated and some other are quite blank. So now, if I asked you to use only 25 colors to represent the image, you would probably choose those colors among the areas where you see a lot of points. Doesn't it sound familiar? Exactly. You are doing some unsupervised learning. The dataset is made of each pixel's color and you just selected some clusters. Each one is a dominant or important color from the image. Now we are ready to understand how the computer can do this job by itself. Let's start with the k-means algorithm. You'll see it's very simple. The first step is to initiate the algorithm. As we want 25 different clusters, we'll start by placing 25 points. The easiest way to do this step is to place each point randomly across the color space. 
Next is the assignment step. Each observation, in this case each pixel's color, is being assigned to the nearest point among the 25 ones. We use the Euclidean distance and iterate through the points to find the nearest one. We can represent this with some Voronoi cells. I used a shader so each pixel gets the nearest point and adapts its color. This results in a Voronoi diagram, which is handy to visualize which pixel color will be assigned to which point. Now we are ready to proceed to the update step. For each point, we compute the mean of each observation assigned to this cluster during the previous step. And we set the point position to be equal to this mean. That's why we call this algorithm k-means. Here we have 25 means. Now we can iterate through the assignment and update steps. And as you can see, the means are moving along and it seems they are fitting the image colors nicely. At some point, reiterating doesn't change the result anymore. That happens when the assignments no longer change. As the mean of each cluster is the same, the means are not moving anymore. Notice that when we use the Euclidean distance, we are sure the algorithm will converge. Now that we are done, let's see how the image will look using only those 25 colors. Again, we iterate through the image pixels. The color of each pixel is the color of the nearest mean. So each color in a Voronoi cell will be represented by the mean's color. The result is pretty good. Using only 25 colors, we can recognize the threes roof, walls, and the grass in front. But we should compare it with another algorithm. So let's discover the Kohonen map, also called self-organizing map. This time, the initialization isn't random. We place 25 points in a 5x5 grid. Then we'll do 2500 iterations, one for each pixel. First, we need to shuffle the pixel color list so we don't start with only green pixels, for example. Then, for each pixel, we first need to find the nearest map node using the Euclidean distance. Let's call this node N. N is the best matching unit. Then, we loop through the map nodes and we change their position. Let's call the current node M and P of M is the position of M in the space. O is the current observation value, in this case the color of the current pixel. S is the current step. It is incremented for each observation. The new position of our point M is equal to the old position of M plus theta of N, M and S times alpha of S times the current observation position minus the position of our current point. Let me detail it. The last term orientates the shifting toward the observation. It is a simple vector difference Notice that the further we are from the observation, the stronger will shift the map node. Alpha is here to reduce the strength of the shifting over time. As we iterate through each observation, we don't want to change the map that much, otherwise the previous step will be overwritten. A common formula for alpha is to use a decreasing exponential. Theta is the neighborhood function. It decreases the shift strength for the nodes that are far from the best matching unit. This function can return 1 if the current point is close enough to the best matching unit on the map or 0 otherwise. Another common formula is this one. With d being the distance between m and n on the Kohonen map. It can be the Manhattan distance for example. So the smallest number of segments needed to reach a point. As you can notice, there are some formulas and constants you can adjust. It took me a lot of trying to get some interesting results. I think it depends on the problem you want to solve. I'll put a snippet with the code used for each example so you can get inspiration from it. From an intuitive point of view, for each data, we are updating the map by shifting the nearest node and pulling its navel as if the segments were some kind of elastic cord. Alright, now let's watch the Kohonen map in action. It looks really good. Almost every node is situated in a dense area. 
Let's see how it looks if we apply it to the image. That looks fantastic. Only 4 nodes out of 25 are almost not used. And this is totally normal, as a coherent map is supposed to give you the clusters, but also the distance between some clusters. Those unused nodes are here to tell that there is a lot of difference between this node and the other ones. Let's now compare the two algorithms. The error is the difference between the resulting image pixel colors and the original pixel colors. Then I just compute a mean error over each pixel. The Kohonen one is performing better. Even if it's not supposed, as it uses clusters to show the distance as I mentioned before. This is due to the k-means initialization. Placing the points randomly often gives a really bad result. Some initialization techniques allows us to tackle this problem. But I wanted to try an original ID, which is to initiate k-means with the result from a coherent map. Let's try this. The result looks really good and is much less prone to randomness. The only random thing happening is when we shuffle the color list for Kohon. Let's compare the results. And it seems our new combined algorithm outperformed the others. That's cool. Now that we've seen how those algorithms work, I want to show you a coherent map evolving in a three dimension space. Coherent maps are often used with high dimensional data. So their goal is to make it easier to visualize and analyze. We'll keep the same example. And this time we'll use the three dimensions to visualize our colors. One dimension is for the red channel, another for the green and a last one for the blue channel. At the origin we have a full black color and the limits of the space are forming a cube. Let's plot some colors. Nice! With this we can reuse our algorithm. First, let's plot each pixel from the image in this cube. Notice that I don't need an oversaturated image now, as I can represent each and every color. Seeing each color from an image in 3D is quite impressive, isn't it? By the way, this is how the oversaturated image looks. You can see each color is on the edge of the cube. Let's go back to our example. I've initiated the coherent map like so. Let's iterate and see how it goes. That's looking really good. Let's see the resulting image. Amazing! I made some experiments with other images. I tried to use some colorful images, so it is more interesting to watch. The results are amazing. I think the algorithm is even more effective in this 3D space. This might be due to the fact my 2D color space should have been a cylinder, as the hue is looping around, in fact.
If you watched so far, thank you a ton and I hope you've learned something. Tell me in the comments which subject you would like me to cover next. Leave a like and subscribe to support me. The source code is available in the description if you'd like to play around. If you want to support me further, there is a link to my Patreon in the comments. You will get early access to Brainscape, an indie game I'm working on. Also join our Discord server so you can exchange further with the community. See you soon. Thank you.